All right, guys, we're going to get started here. So some brief uh, announcements. Uh, February is Heart Health Month. As you know, these are members of uh, our community who went out in the snow in support of uh, Wear Red on February the 13th because Her Heart Matters, Women's Heart Disease, is under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-supported. Um, and so we want to bring attention to that, and that's sort of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada's uh, message for this year. Okay, so those of you who don't uh, know about us, we are the Center for Cardiovascular Investigations. You can see the various faculty members here. We represent uh, colleges and departments all across uh, the University of Guelph. We do different, we each do different types of research, but collectively uh, come together. Okay, we were approved by the University of Guelph Senate in 2015, and our rationale was to transform our thinking about cardiovascular disease. Uh, to combine our efforts because we have strengths from basic research to clinical translation. And what we want to do is discover new ways to diagnose heart disease, advance therapies leading to longer, healthier lives, and of course train the next generation of clinicians and scientists taking this work forward. Um, Heart disease, as you know, is the leading cause of death uh, worldwide, cardiovascular disease, and as such is a really important area to uh, investigate. And members of our faculty have been awarded more than 14 million in competitive research funding over the last five years from all the major funding agencies across Canada. And collectively as a cardiovascular center, especially for the students out there, if you want to know more about us, you can Google Cardiovascular Research Guelph, and our website will come up showing all the investigators, the students. If you are a student member, this is something you can put on your CV to show people the really vibrant community that we have here at the University of Guelph, as well as our educational uh, programs, some of our facilities if you want to collaborate with other groups, publications, and uh, news. Okay, I didn't switch it, so I'm going to uh, invite John to come up for a minute and tell us uh, about Ride for Heart. All right, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we've done ever since we became the center in 2015 is every year we've had a team go for the Ride for Heart, uh, and we do that in Toronto. And how do I know it's been five years? Is because every year you get a medal <laughs> when you finish the race. So I've got five medals. Five years. So this will be our sixth year here. Uh, and then if you do really well, they'll give you the actual jersey to ride on. So we're the VIP Ride for Heart. And you get to wear that on the day. I've got two of them. That's all I could get. Um, and they have different lengths of rides, 25, 50, 75K. I am not a, a, a cyclist. I cycle once a year. And it's this race. I was asked, I asked someone, should I train? And they said, how long do you have? I said, I'm going in a week. They said, forget it, just go. Because otherwise you'll just be so sore. So I go once a year, do the 25K, it's fantastic. They also have a walk as well. Uh, used to have a run, so anybody can participate. So we're just asking you if you'd like to participate. It's great fun. It's a wonderful event. We get to go downtown Toronto. They shut down the gardener and part of the DM, uh, DVP and you're, you're cycling or walking right under the CN Tower on the, on the Gardener. It's completely open. It's a lot. Of, it's great. And so uh, if you join our team before February 29th, so before the Saturday, it's 50% off the registration fee. I think it's around a $50 registration fee. So it's a really good idea to get in there early and register for our team. Very simple to join. You just search for the team, Guelph Cardiovascular Center, uh, when you log in and you'll be part of our team and I can get in touch with you. All right, thanks a lot. And I think the next people are... Tammy. There you go. No worries. <laughs> okay, guys, so um, it's really not a race. If you're a racing person, you can go out and race it and time yourself. Uh, and some people do, but if not, like when I go, sometimes on the uphill, there's like little kids on tricycles going faster than me. So that's totally cool too. You can also sign up with your friends and your family. So if other members of your lab aren't going or you want to do it with friends and family, that's totally cool too. It's just a lot of fun. Okay. And thank you so much, John and Grace and everybody for organizing each year. 
Uh, okay, so just a little bit about who we are. So we put on these cardiovascular scientist seminars uh, like today. Uh, and other days, and the reason why we do it is one, we want you to know what we do here at the University of Guelph. Two, we want the students to start being able to network better and better between the labs, and three, we want to attract the best and brightest undergraduate students to cardiovascular and health sciences uh, research. And so some of you may have seen these other talks, these are we tend to do ones internally, as well as ones externally where we have distinguished scientists coming in. We want to tell them a little bit about what we do and also start to learn about what else is going on in Canada. For those of you who are undergraduate or graduate students too, you might have your sights on traveling, maybe doing research in other parts of Canada, maybe going to BC for example. So it gives you a chance to meet some of the big uh, researchers out there and hear what they're doing so that you have sort of this information if you want to approach uh, faculties and places around Canada. Okay, we also do our research day. Our first one was in 2016. You probably recognize glad a bunch of the people who have been here. Um, the next one was in 2018, and uh, myself and Nina Jones helped co-chair this one, and the next one is going to be in 2020. We have raised about $16,000 already, so yay, uh, to be able to put this together to bring more people from across Canada, and as well uh, to do some career day stuff. So those of you who don't want to be doctors, who don't want to be academics, we're really going to start to focus on where other places are that you can use your degree uh, to be successful as well. Um, one of the things we started last time, in addition to Research Day, was this idea of SOCRA, Southern Ontario Cardiovascular Research Association. And so that's so that we take the big name people that come to meet you, but also build up the opportunities for the students to present uh, and be able to be part of a national conference as well. It really focuses on the students. So come get involved in that or email me if you want to. And the rationale for it, Jeremy's not here today, but the rationale is really that all of these places, really proximate to us, do cardiovascular research. And not only do we want to get to know each other, but we want to know the PIs and the students in all these labs that you can see on this map near us across southern Ontario as well. This is an awesome field to be in. Okay, so we created this. Uh, it starts in with Guelph, York University, Western, Queens, U of T, and Dalhousie. It's a cool thing to do because you get a national presentation line on your CV. So the next year, last year, we did it at York University, and we're back here in the fall, so contact me if you want to be involved. Uh, and with that, I'm going to introduce the students who have a lot to do with the running of this day and organization. Hello, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Student Executive Council, I would like to welcome you to today's CCVI Distinguished Scientist Seminar. Uh, just a few notes before we start. Um, first, I would like to thank all the student executive council that's from different lab and undergrad rep for helping to coordinate with their lab and promoting this event. Next, uh, please take photo, tweet photos, and use hashtag CCVI, hashtag Guelph. And also, you're welcome to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter using this account. All right, so for today's talk, it's going to be about 40 minutes long. So for our speaker, we'll have some student reps come stand up at the front when you have a few minutes left. At the end of the talk, we're going to do about a 10-minute question period. And after that, we encourage everyone in the audience, please come down to the front. Use that as a sort of networking period. You can talk to our speaker, talk to your peers. And we definitely encourage you to use that to network and collect, uh, connect a little bit with everybody here. So we also want to thank um, Biomed, OVC, and CBS for sponsoring today's pizza lunch. And so next, I have the honor of calling on Dr. Todd Gillis to introduce today's speaker. Right. So I've got two microphones for you here. Okay, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Glenn Tibbetts. Dr. Tibbetts, originally from Montreal, did his PhD at UCLA and then held positions at Nagita College in Japan, UCLA, and the University of Washington. Currently, Dr. Tibbetts is a professor in biomedical physiology and kinesiology at Simon Fraser University, as well as a principal scientist at BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. Dr. Tibbetts held a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair 
in molecular cardiac physiology from 2004 to 2018, and has also played significant roles at NSERC, CIHR, and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, as acting as both a member and a, a chair of grant review panels. Dr. Tibbetts' research program is focused on the molecular mechanisms that regulate cardiac function and how changes to these can lead to dysfunction and heart failure. This work utilizes a variety of animal models, including rabbits, rats, and zebrafish, and spans multiple levels of biological organization. Dr. Tibbetts' research program has always been pushing at boundaries and leading the way to new technological approaches. I joined his lab over 20 years ago as a PhD student uh, to manipulate the structure and function of cardiac proteins. While I was in his lab, he built his own confo confocal microscope to study changes in cardiac myocyte structure and electrophysiological properties during embryonic development. Since I left his lab, he has now developed techniques to utilize optical mapping to study cardiac function in live zebrafish, applied molecular dynamic simulations to characterize the function of cardiac contractile proteins, as well as pursued the use of pluripotent stem cells to study and treat cardiac dysfunction in humans. It is this work that he, is, he will be talking about today. Welcome, Dr. Tibbetts. Oh, is it mobile? It's good, yep. You can put it in your pocket. I can take this. Yeah, so this can go in your pocket. Yep. You can get your set up. Okay. Thank you, Tammy and Todd. Can everyone hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about using induced pluripotent stem cells, human, to make cardiomyocytes and to study inherited arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. So actually it's a pleasure to be in Guelph, a pleasure to be even associated with people like Peter Bax. I had dinner with Peter Bax on Monday night. I have the most respect for the guy. He's an incredible scientist. And it was just really good chatting with him and to be associated with him in the same seminar series is really an honor. My first time in Guelph, which is a nice place. Uh, <laughs> I should come back in July, I think, right? The, the irony is that my brother uh, works at Conestoga College and he lives in Kitchener, uh, but I've never been to Guelph. So uh, this is SFU. Uh, and, but the work I'm going to be talking about started at SFU many years ago, but I've moved my lab on stem cells to BC Children's Hospital, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So, uh, please feel free to interrupt and ask any questions because some of the stuff will be jargonese, and I sometimes don't catch myself using jargonese. Hang on. So, we're talking about inherited rhythmias, so usually we're talking about inherited mutations, and mostly we're talking about point mutations in a variety of different proteins. And we think of cardiac rhythmias, we most commonly think of ion channel dysfunction. And so these could be mutations that cause a change in how an ion channel opens, inactivates, gets trafficked to the membrane. It could be mutations in ancillary proteins that modulate function but it could result in a gain or a loss of function and still result in a very serious arrhythmia. Now the arrhythmia that I'm showing here is a unique type of arrhythmia. It's actually called CPVT, it's exercise induced, but the concept is the same, is that the channel dysfunction, whether it's hyper or hypo functioning, can cause an arrhythmia which may or may not be triggered by exercise. And most people are familiar with arrhythmias being caused by channelopathies. But the other aspect that we've been very interested in are cardiomyopathies. Now these are mutations typically in the contractile proteins, thin filament, thick filament, et cetera. And we know them from the effects they have on the structural properties of the heart. Hypertrophy or dilated cardiomyopathy, these are the most common. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize, even some cardiologists I talked to, that most of these people that have these will die from an arrhythmia that's induced by the mutation and the change in function of a thin or thick filament protein. And in fact, as you know, Jay Bomeister, Canadian Olympian, gold medalist, defenseman for the St. Louis Blues, collapsed on the bench last week 
more than likely, he had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutation that got manifested and he had sudden cardiac arrest. And that's the kind of thing we look at. The newspapers don't tell us very much, but the probability is it's something related to that. So the question how to contractile protein dysfunction cause arrhythmias is a really an interesting story and something I'll allude to in my talk today. So how do we study these things? Well, classically, what people have done for channelopathies is we use heterolysis expression systems. So we have a clone version of a human ion channel and we transfect it into a, an expression system like a HEK or a CHO cell or a oocyte, and then we patch it and look at it. This is a great model for looking at uh, structure function relationships for the biophysics of an ion channel. But honestly, they're not good to study arrhythmias because arrhythmias are very complex events that are multicellular in nature. So often we're looking at action potentials being conducted across a sheet of heart tissue and the arrhythmia is caused by how it inter cells interact with other cells. The other way is with transgenic mice, and this has been insightful, but the problem with transgenic mice in this field is that the translational capacity of transgenic mice isn't what it could be because the heart rates of the mice are typically six or 700 beats per minute, we're beating at 70 beats per minute. It means the contractile proteins, the channel leads are functioning quite differently. So we've had real problems translating the transgenic mice story from arrhythmias into the human. So in terms of contractile proteins, it's even more difficult because we don't have things like patch clamping and things which have been so instructive and allow us to look at single molecule function. We have assays now in contractile proteins. John does some and Todd has done some. Uh, they're not uh, as easily done as say patch clamping and the relationship between those and arrhythmias is challenging. So I had been studying for year, many years these things in native heart tissue from rats, from rabbits, as Todd mentioned, and we even have a zebrafish model in our lab right now. Um, but in 2006, uh, Shinya Yamanaka came up with this incredible process, most of which you probably already know about, but the story is actually quite amazing. So he is, is an orthopedic surgeon, at, uh, in Kyoto University. And he also works at the Gladstone Institute, which is this incredible place in San Francisco, where a lot of the stem cell work was done. And he was sort of on a postdoc there. And the real problem in those days was the, the fact that there was an embargo on using embryonic stem cells because of the ethical, ethical concerns. So he wanted to develop a technique in which he could circumvent the whole idea of getting stem cells from embryos, IVF rejects or whatever. And so he, with his group, developed this incredible technique where they were able to take somatic cells, in this case he took fibroblasts, and infected them with what we now call the Yamanaka factors. And these are four transcription factors that transform these cells over the period of five weeks from a somatic cell into a neonate, uh, not a neonate, but an uh, pluripotent stem cell, completely transformed, reprogrammed within the span of five weeks. So this is shown here. These are the Yamanaka factors. People will still fool around with these. There's questions about OCK3 and 4, but the basic idea is, is the same as we're putting these pluripotency factors into a cell. The cell is transformed. It's, an, it's a really an amazing process. So then once they've been reprogrammed after 30 to 50 days, then we have the capability of, of differentiating these into a variety of cells. So they could be differentiated, as I'll show you, into heart cells, but also a lot of people are trying to make neurons to treat Parkinson's disease. My colleague uh, is working on making pancreatic beta cells from iPSC-derived cells to treat type 1 diabetes. So I was sitting there, this paper, first paper came out in 2006, in cell, I believe, in mice and then 2007 in humans, I read the paper and I just said, this is incredible, this is transformative. I said, I wanna do this, but I have no right to do this. No one, I have no credibility, I have no money to do this kind of work. And I just sat on it for a number of years. And then in 2011, my CRC got renewed for another seven years. And I said, okay, we're gonna go for it. I had some discretionary money. We put a whole bunch of money into this in 2011. 
real gamble, but it was really an exciting gamble at the time. The next year, Shinji Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize. So I felt like maybe we're going in the right direction, but can we get credibility? Can we actually do these experiments? So we started doing them in 2011, and it's been a long story. But I want to tell you about the development of this center that we've developed the Children's Hospital, and that's going to be woven into a story of how we use iPSCs to look at inherent arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. So this is a cellular regenerative medicine center that we're developing at uh, Children's Hospital. And my colleague, who's co-director, is Francis Lin. And Francis Lin is the son for whom an award is named at, at Guelph. That's the irony. So Dennis Lin, there's an award in zoology for him. He was a zoologist. And he died tragically a year ago while he was, he's a marine biologist, and he was diving off the coast of Vancouver. And he was sitting on the shore and got hit by a wave and knocked unconscious against a rock. So you have a, an award in his honor. His son works with me. He could be my son, except uh, I'm too young to have a son. Uh, so this is what we started by, by doing. We started by using the Yamanaka process. So we were taking biopsies from the backs of patients that were harboring long QT syndrome making a fibroblast culture and using the Yamanaka technique, which involves some retroviruses, et cetera. But it was a really challenging thing. A lot of things weren't really, that were really difficult to do. Around the same time, I think 2012, colleague of Shinji Yamanaka, Keiichi Fukuda, at Keio University in Tokyo, developed this new adaptation of the same technology. And the major differences were that he started with blood cells instead of fibroblasts that you had to do a biopsy for. And the PBMCs in particular, the monocytes, and what we do is we expand that, the, the T-cell population specifically, and then we infect the T-cells with a different kind of virus called the Sendai virus, and Sendai is a city in northeast Japan, uh, which is a non-integrating virus. It doesn't get into the genome like the retrovirus does. So, and it also is mutated so that it leaves the cell after a few passages. So it's no longer residing in the host cell, unlike the retroviruses. So this is transformative in terms of the technique. And so we went to uh, Keiichi's lab in uh, Shinjuku in Tokyo, and we spent about a month there learning his technique. And so we adapted that from what we were originally using to using this technique on blood cells. Five mLs of blood from a patient, we can make their cardiac myocytes. Okay, so the next process is genome editing of the iPSCs. And the reason we genome edit is that we are taking PBMCs from patients, and so my colleagues, several cardiologists, are dealing with patients that are harboring mutations that are, could be lethal arrhythmias, like the J. Bomeister thing, they could die when they're six years of age, suddenly, unexpectedly, from a mutation they have. So the idea is, can we do, in a dish, predict the dangers that they might have with that mutation? But to do a control, what we do is we genome edit with CRISPR-Cas9, we reverse that mutation and put in the wild type. So we're comparing pairwise the patient with the patient minus their mutation. It's called an isogenic control, which has some advantages, and then we can make iPSCs from them, and these are, have been modified, genome edited. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9, as you are probably familiar with, is uh, basically has been carried by Jennifer Doudna and uh, others throughout the world, and they'll probably win the Nobel Prize for their work. It, it's been transformative. But what we do is we have a plasmid which has the CRISPR-Cas9. It has the guide RNAs which allow the Cas9 to localize onto the genome, specifically at the place where the cut is made. And we co-transfect the uh, single-stranded oglinucleotide donor, which repairs the mutation or introduces the mutation, depending on how we're doing the experiment. We have a GFP marker, transfect, we sort for the GFP, and then we look and sequence uh, for the homologous directed repair. And homologous directed repair might occur in two to five percent of the total cells that are affected by the CRISPR-Cas9. So we might be sequencing 200 colonies to find a couple 
that have the correct repair and have introduced or removed the mutation of interest. And so this is a lot of sequencing. We've now replaced the sequencing by doing digital droplet PCR and screening in a kind of a really elegant technique much faster. So first of all, do we have any questions? How are we doing? Are we okay? All right. Thumb, one thumb up <laughs> from one person. Okay, that's a real feel encouraged by that. I'll move forward. Uh, and then we can have the colonies and we establish lines based on these mutations can carry those forward. You know, it's a little more complicated than that. But what we have to do and what's really important is the quality control. And this is a part that's missing. So fortunately, making iPSCs has become incredibly simpler in the last three or four years. Stem Cell Technologies, which is based in Vancouver, biggest biotech company in Canada, projected a billion dollars in sales next year, makes a lot of kits that you can use. And some of these kits are good. We don't use a lot of their kits, but we use some of their kits. Uh, there's reasons why. We want more control over the media, et cetera. We want the ability to manipulate them. But they do make some kits, but it means people can come in off the street and be making iPSCs, which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. We have bioterrorists using CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9 to do whatever they want, and we have this ridiculous guy in China CRISPRing twin babies. So there are a lot of ethical issues here. We are not putting cells into patients, but we have to worry about the quality control. What exactly are we talking about? Well, there are many factors we have to screen for. One is a mycoplasma infection, which you can't see. So you have to test for a PCR reaction. Are the cells pluripotent? The classical assay is a teratoma. So, but this is a very expensive assay. So you inject these cells into a mouse and then you look for the formation of a teratoma. You have to do a lot of histology. Very expensive, very time consuming. Uh, stem cell technologies make some kits that are very good. We have a whole bunch of assays that involve immunocytochemistry, uh, digital droplet PCR, quantitative RT-PCR, looking for factors that are reflective of pluripotency. But probably the most convenient one, the one that's most comprehensive, stem cell technologies makes it, and it's looking to see whether these cells can go down the three germ lines. And so the kit allows you to differentiate them into those lines and then look for markers to see whether, in fact, your iPSCs are pluripotent. Okay. But this is the one that people don't realize. The genomic aberrations, the chromosomal anomalies that appear, might appear in 30 or 40 percent of your colonies. It's incredibly high and people don't realize it. This can result in huge deletions of a gene, trisomies, a whole bunch of things that are created by your tissue culture conditions. So you have to look for this, but most people don't. How do you look for it? Well, the classic is G-band karyotyping. Uh, there's a stem cell mix and iPSC kit, and we use nanopore. And I'll just show you nanopore if you're not familiar with. We extract very long strand of DNA, and then it goes through this membrane, and it reads the charge, and the charge is base specific. So you can screen, sequence the DNA. You can look for chromosomal aberrations. We're just developing the screen right now with Terry Snatch. Okay, in addition to that, we have a whole bunch of curated iPSC lines which we use to look at experiments. And these lines, we put reporters in. We have a reporter in the Randine receptor. We have a reporter that's reporting on the calcium concentration inside the lumen of the SR, as well as the cytosol. We have another one with GFP in the alpha actininin, in which we can measure sarcomere shortening in a live cell. So these are some of the reporter lines that we have. We're developing a lot more. And then we can genome edit now to put in the mutation that we think is causal for the inherited arrhythmia or the cardiomyopathy. And the BC Children's Hospital has this incredible biobank, so we could put all these lines there and keep them for future use. They store well as iPSCs, they don't store well as terminally differentiated cells. So this is the next part. We take iPSCs and we differentiate them into beating cardiomyocytes. This is the trickiest part. Again, stem cell technologies has a kit called stem diff. But this is really what you're doing, is you're walking the cells through the embryonic stages of cardiac development. 
And these are the various stages. We go through a mesoderm, progenitor, cardiac mesoderm, progenitor, and then beating cardiomyocytes right here. The last stage is really challenging, and I'll talk about it, and that is a mature cardiomyocyte. This is sort of the Achilles heel of the field, going from here to here. But going from here to here, we have ways in which we can do it. It's still very challenging. So if you look at people like Gordon Keller, who has published impressive stuff as a developmental biologist, looking at controlling these pathways and differentiating iPSCs, uh, he does embryonic stem cells, sorry, into ventricular cardiomyocytes, atrial, into SA nodal, into AV nodal, into endocardial, epicardial, he is producing all these types of cells that make up the heart. Really impressive stuff. But most of us in the field use a different pr approach, and it's more of a, a, a hammer, and it's using a chemical called Kyer. And what it is is selectively activating the Wnt cycling pathway, and then a few days later, inactivating. So the turning on and turning off and the timing of those are absolutely critical. And there's a few other chemicals that I won't talk about that have to be included in here. So in my lab, this was developed uh, by uh, Sanam, who's shown here. She was a PhD student. She just finished her PhD last year. She was in my lab for last year. Now she's at Harvard working on similar diseases. They have an incredible stem cell center there that she's working with. And so she developed this in her own lab to, to make cardiomyocytes. And so here's a dish of cells, a Petri dish, like 35 millimeters. These are blood cells that a phlebotomist took from her blood. And she uh, reprogrammed her own blood cells into iPSCs. And then she differentiated her own iPSCs into cardiomyocytes. So this is the process that she used. And then we have, as soon as we start differentiating, the pluripotency markers, Nanog and OC34, they fall off precipitously. The cell is no longer pluripotent one or two days into our differentiation protocol. At the same time, cardiac specific genes are starting to be upregulated, troponin T, troponin I, et cetera. So this is sitting in culture, and after about 10 days, it's amazing, but the whole Petri dish starts beating. And you'll see beating cells a lot, but what is unique about this is these are beating in synchrony, which means that um, this 35 millimeter, we probably have tens of thousands of cells running across this plate. What it means is they're not only expressing connexin 43, which we can measure, but the hemi channels are actually forming connexins and gap junctions between cells, and the conduction velocity across that plate is almost close to what happens in a human heart. Furthermore, these cells are beating at a rate of about 50 or 60 beats per minute, and so they sit in the incubator. Now, it turns out that this, uh, this came out uh, January a couple of years ago, and uh, the publicist at SFU asked her grad students, do you have anything interesting for Valentine's Day? And one of the grad students yeah, said, yeah, we have a bunch of human hearts beating. Uh, and so the people came down. I didn't know about this. I was in my office. And uh, so they interviewed Saddam, and they showed this, and this went sort of viral like five, six years ago. But people were, you know, on Valentine's Day asking Sanam, you know, for her heart, and she just sent them out Petri dishes, beating heart cells. She didn't have to worry about any other crap, the social interactions, just sent them the crap. So she was happy with that. So, but what do we do with these things? So the next thing we can do, and this is what I'm gonna talk about, is maturing these cells and making them actually, despite the fact they're beating, they haven't reached the profile of a mature cell yet. So this is some of the differences. This is a mature native cell. This is an iPSC carried through the stages that I've talked about. And what they're missing are T-tubules. They're missing uh, uh, some of the proteins that are expressed in the T-tubules and missing a well-developed, certainly structured sarcoplasm reticulum compared to these two. But we know now, and this is a huge field of research as you can imagine, uh, that we can convert or we can stimulate going from here to here through a variety of techniques. Let me do these one at a time. One is through chemical stimuli. We have about five or six different stimuli that we know can facilitate uh, maturation. One is T3, thyroid hormone. The other are free fatty acids, glucose deprivation. Um, uh, you've got some here. Uh, and also uh, things like mTOR that 
uh, sorry, that TORN1, that block mTOR, and are thought to increase P53 activity. So there's a whole field of this which is really getting interesting in terms of how do we make these cells into mature cells. In addition to that, we know if we electrically stimulate these cells in culture, they will start maturing. If we mechanically stimulate them, if we give them an extracellular matrix to grow on, like channels to grow on, these all facilitate the maturation process. So these are things that are going on in our lab. All right, so from the maturation process and even from the being cells, what we're doing right now is tissue engineering. And so this tissue engineering can take many forms. What I showed you before was a monolayer of she a sheet of cells grown as a single layer thick, so a two-dimensional, but maybe three, three or four centimeters in width. And so cells, uh, electrical signals can be conducted across the cells. But in addition to that, we can get into much more elaborate tissue engineering. And this is a piece of equipment we've just purchased, and it's made by Aspect Biosystems in Vancouver. It's a 3D bioprinter. Now this is not the kind of printer you can buy from Amazon. This is a quarter of a million dollar printer. But what it does is it can take multiple different cell types and mixes them with a bioink, which is the extracellular matrix of your choice. So you can mix things that are collagen based or whatever. They get mixed together and they get, go through a microfluidic device and they get printed on this thing in a way that you want. So if you're looking at uh, increase uh, whatever, you know, collagen formation. You can mix those in different ratios with the heart cells. And you can mix fibroblasts with the heart cells and create different templates. Adam Feinberg at Pittsburgh last uh, October had an article in Science where he printed a 3D heart. It, it was very impressive. You should read it if you haven't read it already. So we're working on that right now, but the most important thing is the phenotyping. And the phenotyping of these cells takes the form of genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and a whole bunch of functional studies, including optical mapping, which I'll talk about briefly, um, atomic force microscopy, et cetera, et cetera. Very detailed, very uh, sophisticated phenotyping. So these are the cells, but this is what we can do in an optical mapping. So we can actually look at the conduction velocities across the plate. And it turns out the conduction velocities, when we're plated well, and allow the cells to sit in culture for about a week, conduction velocities are about half that of a human heart. So in a human native heart, these might be 50 centimeters per second. So it's quite impressive. And this is a monolayer. We think in 3D, with 3D structures that we're starting to print now, this will be uh, facilitated. But it's, it's fascinating. So as I said, this means that the gap junctions are formed, so the hemi-channel of one cell has made a connection and allowed a gap, gap junction to form. We know that from the conduction velocity. It's one thing to measure the expression of connection 43, looking at the transcript or even the protein. It's another thing to have a functional channel. And these things do it by themselves. We're not doing anything to intervene. So in the optical mapping, what we can do in that plate is we can look at the membrane potential shown in black here. And this is a spontaneously beating plate of heart cells, a monolayer. And the calcium transient shown in red, this is all done by an optical mapping setup that we built and uh, software that we wrote over a span of about five or six years. It's been evolving continuously, but it's allowed us to look at perturbations and things in both the electrical properties and the calcium handling properties in these cells. So this is just to give you an example. Here's that same plate I looked at before, and we've got four different ROIs here shown in different colors. And here is from one OR, here's the calcium transient right here, and this is the voltage transient. So the voltage signal from the particular dye we're using has a reverse uh, direction of switch. So it actually goes negative as the cell gets depolarized. Uh, so this is reversed in our software, and this is from a different ROI. And so we can look at the conduction time between two different ROIs, and we can also see if there's asynchrony between them, which would suggest that the conduction is not appropriate from cell to cell. There may be a gap, there may be something that's stopping the electrical impulse. So this is just one couple of applications I'll show you. One of my PH, former PhD students, Laura Dewar, what has been, had been a coroner in BC for 20 years. And one of the things that she had done that she found very frustrating is she had to investigate a lot of sudden infant deaths. And she would go to the site where an infant had died 
and have to deal with the parents who obviously are devastated. It's bad enough that their child died. It's the fact that they feel that they were somehow guilty and they have no known cause of death. That's the real problem. So she came to my lab wanting to do a PhD. And interestingly, she had done a master's degree at Guelph um, a long time ago. Um, a long time ago. So just she became to BC, was a coroner for 20 years, wanted to do a PhD at a, you know, a no longer spring chicken stage of her life. And she had a connection with all the medical examiners across Canada as being a, being a coroner. So one of the connections she had was with the medical, medical examiner of Manitoba. And they had 191, there's more now, tissue samples from infants who had died. And they had gone through a complete autopsy, which was negative. Toxicology scan, completely negative. X-ray analysis, completely negative. These children, these infants, died for no apparent reason. So what they asked us to do, is there some mutation or something that might be associated with sudden cardiac arrest? So we knew that there is a relationship. It's not clear on how frequent this is. So we sequenced uh, a panel of about 100 genes uh, and looked for cardiac specific mutations that might be causal in sudden cardiac death. So we found a lot of mutations associated with long QT and CPVT, which are probably ascribable to sudden cardiac death. But the thing that was really interesting is that we found this unique mutation in troponin I, but it's a troponin I that's only expressed in infants. And after about a year of age, we switched from a skeletal, so skeletal to a cardiac form of troponin I. So they were harboring mutation in a gene that's only expressed in the heart in the first nine or 12 months of age. But this mutation, people hadn't heard of. So we were able to use the tools we had to look at this mutation. So Todd mentioned the molecular dynamic studies. We did the simulation studies, sorry. We did these, uh, 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 we did this in conjunction with Peter Tillman in which we had reconfigured the mutation at R37 to 37C, or R37C is the mutation. What we found is in the simulations is that the introduction introduced of the cytosine here, uh, cysteine, sorry, uh, it completely broke the uh, hydrogen bonding between the troponin I and the troponin T. So we thought this was really indicative of, uh, how am I doing for time? 15? Yeah, you okay. have 15. Okay. Tell me if I have to hurry, all right? Uh, so anyways, in the modeling, what we found was a really serious disruption in terms of how the, the troponin I and the troponin T interacted based on the simulations. So we thought we would pursue this. We also did a phylogenetic analysis, and it turns out the R at 237 is highly conserved all the way into zebrafish. So 400 million years of evolution, the R at that position has been conserved. So we thought this was really potentially a very significant mutation. So the next thing we did was with recombinant proteins reconstituting a thin filament and we did this in conjunction with John Davis at Ohio State University. We did it at SFU but we learned a lot of the techniques from him and it involves putting a reporter into the uh, troponin C and reconstituting the thin filament with human TNC, TNI, TNT, tropomyosin and unlike John we used native actin and we made a thin filament, and we looked at the ability of calcium to bind and the rate that calcium comes off to see whether this could be a factor in how the, dis the mutation was disruptive. So what we found was that we made, first of all, we made a, a neonatal wild, uh, wild type. So the neonate thin filament is, expresses different proteins. One paralog is different, one splice variant is different. The paralog is troponin I. The spice variant is troponin T. I won't go into all the details, but this is just the wild type. And so there's a much higher affinity in the wild type. It's reversed somewhat by the mutation that we introduced. But the off rate constant right here is greatly reduced in both the neonate and the neonate with the wild type. So this is something that we thought was indicative of something, a mishandling of calcium that could be arrhythmogenic. So, we introduced the same mutation into iPSCs and then differentiated them into cardiomyocytes. So in the wild type iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, we paste them, 
So they're beating typically at 50 beats per minute. We pace them at 55 beats per minute, 75 beats per minute, 120 beats per minute. This is the voltage transient or the action potential right here. This is the calcium transient right here. So you can see what happens at 55 beats per minute. When we accelerate it, we see something that's reflected what's called voltage in calcium restitution. It means the action potential gets shorter as the heart rate gets higher. This is a really important property of cardiac muscle, and we see it very clearly in these iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, and again as we go to higher heart rates. When we introduce the mutation in troponin I, in, this, in the neonatal form of troponin I, they beat very well at 55 beats per minute. We, when we go to 75 beats per minute, we start seeing alternants. And we go to higher rates, even slightly higher, 80 beats per minute. We could not go to 120 beats per minute. We could not entrain the cells to beat at those frequencies with that mutation. So these are isogenic controls, virtually identical except for the mutation. So this is strongly suggested that these infants died in infancy because of this mutation. Probably they had some event which accelerated their heart rate, high temperature, fever, they were mobile, something happened, triggered this arrhythmia, and they died. So right now we're trying to go back to the community and look for that as a marker, potential marker of sudden infant death. And here's the restitution property. So this is the cycle length. This is lower heart rates, higher heart rates. This is the duration of the action potential. This is a normal restitution. The action potential gets shorter as heart rate gets higher. This is what happens with the mutation. Almost no restitution and it just stops you. We can't make them go to any higher heart rates. Very serious mutation. So how are we doing? Any questions on the sudden infant death? Yeah. So with CPBT, like you see that same, like the, as the heart rate gets faster, the arrhythmia uh, comes on set. And that, that's because of exercise induction or stress induction, right? So we, we haven't done CPT. We're doing CPT. I haven't shown anything on CPT. Oh, no, I was asking, like, like it looks pretty similar to what we see in, in, with the sudden Yes, okay, You're about CPD? Yeah. You want me to digress for a sec, or? Sure. <laughs> Do I have time to digress? Uh, let me come back at the end, okay, because yeah. it's kind of tangential to what I'm talking about, but it's kind of related. All right, and so just to give you another idea of what we're doing right now, I work with a clinician, Zach Laxman, who runs the uh, inherited uh, arrhythmia clinic at St. Paul's Hospital, part of UBC. So he's a young cardiologist who's trained in electrophysiology, but he also runs the lone atrial fibrillation clinic. So these are patients that have AF that have an inherited component to what they, uh, the, the trigger of their disease. So we've been differentiating cells into atrial specific cardiomyocytes to look specifically at genes that might be involved in developing or producing AF. I say AF all the time, and I know for millennials, AF means something completely different. Uh, but let me just forge on, okay? Uh, it's, I'm too old to change my ways. AF is AF, okay. Um, so we changed the protocol and basically involved using retinoic acid in a sort of complicated way. But we get these cells, <clears throat> and these cells allow us now to introduce genomic mutations that we think are associated with AF. And these are include lone AF patients that Zach gets from his clinic, but also we look at GWAS identified AF variants. So they have huge populations and they do correlations between a population that has AF and what kind of uh, you know, SNPs do they have, et cetera, et cetera. What's the correlation? So there's a variety of SNPs that we've introduced into our cells now. And we have a whole bunch of patients that Zach is producing that have AF, and they develop AF very early and no comorbidities. So the AF is produced probably by something they've inherited. Okay, so what we've done is we've differentiated these into cardiomyocytes, and here we have our ventricular cardiomyocytes that we've done through the protocol I showed originally, and these are our atrial cardiomyocytes through the protocol I just showed. This is the, the calcium uh, action potential right here. Here's the calcium transient. So this is consistent with what we see in native atrial cardiomyocytes versus native ventricular cardiomyocytes, shorter action potential. These are the parameters of the, the duration, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to that, 
They show restitution properties, but they also are expressing atrial specific genes. So this is a L-type calcium channel that's unique to the atria, CAV 1.3. The one in the ventricle is CAV 1.2. Uh, this is an inward rectifier that's unique to the atria. This is a potassium channel KV 1.5, which is atrial specific. And this is a particular type of SK channel. This is much more controversial. But clearly we can see upregulation in the transcripts, which are thought to be atrial specific. ANP is produced by the atria, and we're showing that ANP is produced at much greater amounts using ELISA. And then we're looking at the transcripts in a much broader way, and we're using something called nanostring. I don't know, students, are you familiar with nanostring at all? Have you heard of it? All right, it's a really cool technology, and it's produced by a company in Seattle. And what it involves is uh, designing a code set that uh, is encoding for transcripts of your choice. And so it has this, which hybridizes to the transcript of your choice, and it has a barcode which is specific for the transcript that you've designed. And then it has a biotin here which sticks to streptavidin, as you know. And so we designed a code set for 250 transcripts, all of which we think are related to the cardiomyopathies or the arrhythmias, and we could do them all simultaneously, do 250 transcripts. So on the one hand, it's not like RNA-seq, in which you get 10,000 genes and you get sequences, but it has some advantages and so here's what happens. So the capture probe binds to the transcript right here, and then the uh, barcode is read. And so what this means is that you uh, isolate your RNA. You don't have to reverse transcribe it to DNA, and you don't have to amplify the DNA to read it as you do in um, you know, DDPCR or in quantitative PCR. You're directly reading your transcripts. So the camera is counting the number of barcodes that look like this, and this could be troponin I. And if there's a, a red here instead of there, it could be troponin T. So we designed the code set, and then they designed the barcodes that go with each gene, and then they tell us what it is. It counts each one, each transcript individually, and it has housekeeping genes. There's 20 housekeeping genes, and it analyzes the housekeeping genes to see which ones are valid in terms of housekeeping gene criteria. Ones that are not expressed highly enough or eliminated, ones that do not, uh, that do switch between the variables is no longer a housekeeping gene. So it has to be constant across the variable, but it's comparing them to legitimate housekeeping genes from the pool of 20 that it counts. So it's, it, I think it's really cool. And so then you can get, as you do in RNA-seq, I don't know if you're familiar with the volcano plots, but what this is showing is this is the effect of going to a ventricular uh, or sorry, an atrial versus a ventricular differentiation protocol. So the red shows that these are genes that are upregulated as a function of the atrial differentiation. The degree of difference is shown in this direction, and these are ones that are upregulated in the ventricular population. This gene right here is encoding for KV 1.5, an atrial specific potassium channel. And each of these red dots aligns with an atrial specific transcript. So it's really an impressive technique. It's a little expensive, but it allows you to do in one assay 250 transcripts, in our case, simultaneously. In addition to that, this drug, vernaculant, was developed in British Columbia, in Vancouver, as an AF cardioversion drug. And it's been approved by the FDA for IV cardioversion of patients with IF. Not oral, but IV. <clears throat> and when it was designed to treat AF, it treats that channel I just talked about, KV 1.5, it blocks it. But it also blocks a bunch of other things. So almost all of the antiarrhythmics are dirty drugs. And the antiarrhythmics in general are a terrible class of drugs. Some of them are actually pro-arrhythmic. They're really difficult drugs to design because blocking arrhythmias is much more complex, complex than just blocking a single channel. Blocking a single channel almost invariably doesn't work. So we have used the vernaculant, and what we saw, the axe potential in the uh, atrial cardiomyocytes was shortened, uh, sorry, was prolonged immeasurably right here, really significantly, whereas in the ventricular cells, vernaculant had a very modest effect right here. So the colors are showing from the zero to the darker lines, the highest dose, 30 micromolar. So by lengthening the axe potential, 
this is a way of stopping or reducing the probability of a heart going into fibrillation. So as the action potential goes longer, the refractory period gets longer, it's unlikely to have an action potential that's occurring at 600 beats per minute, which is what's happening in AF. Your heart, your ventricles, or atria, or sorry, are beating at 600 beats per minute. So this drug is effective, but we can show in our iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, it's also working selectively on atrial cells as opposed to ventricular cells. So just to summarize, um, this is a really cool tool. And it's my colleague uh, Chuck Murray in Seattle is using it to inject, and he's going to be doing this next year, a billion heart cells into patients post-infarct to improve their ejection fraction. This is not a trivial task. They have to curate all the cells. They have to look at SNPs to make sure they're not carcinogenic, they're not arrhythmogenic, they're not pathogenic in any way. A billion cells. So that's what they're trying to do. They've done it in baboons, obviously in murines, but baboons. Drug development and diagnoses and therapeutics. So this is what we're doing actually is the patients are given to us the patient's blood that might be harboring a mutation for CPVT. We have to screen to see whether that, those heart cells that we make, which are carrying their genome, respond to drugs that might most appropriately block the incidence of CPVT. So a drug, typically the first line of treatment for CPVT is beta blockers. Beta blockers don't always work. In fact, beta blockers sometimes have adverse effects in certain patients. The idea is for that patient specifically with their genome in that dish, is the drug working or is there a better drug or a better combination of drugs? And what's the risk? What is this possibility? They might have a lethal cardiac arrest. So that's the kind of thing we're doing a lot. But the amazing thing and the most exciting thing about this is the confluence of all these things coming together. I mean, every day I'm talking to cardiologists, bioinformaticists, uh, engineers, electrical, optical engineers. Um, it's amazing, nanochemists, microfluidics. It's, it's just incredible how everything is coming together now. It's really a rich field, very exciting. CRISPR, all these things, they're changing on a daily basis. The, the literature is just so rich, so vibrant, and so prolific. So we have a powerful technique for, a technique for a disease in a dish, a dish. We can risk stratify the patients. What I haven't talked about, I've only alluded to, are the tricks and the difficulties of this technique. One I've, I've alluded to, the maturation. And the maturation is, is a problem that is a focus of many labs, and I think we're getting closer to getting a solution, but it's not easy. And the different stimuli for maturation may result in a different type of maturation. In other words, maturation probably involves turning on many different sets of genes simultaneously, and some stimuli may be just invoking a certain set of genes. We don't know all those details. But the most difficult part, and the people that are just using the kits, is that the cells that are produced have incredible variability in their phenotype, unless you know what you're doing. So with that said, I have to uh, thank all of my colleagues. Um, most of the work here was done by a few people in my lab. Everything that I showed was done in my lab, but it was done by Sanam, who I said is now in Harvard. Eric, who d developed and designed all the equipment for optical mapping and the software. Charles Stevens did all the molecular dynamic simulations in conjunction with my colleague Peter Tillman um, in Calgary. Lower, lower Dewar is the uh, coroner. And uh, these guys carried on a lot of the other studies. My cardiologist co colleagues, Jonathan Davies, some of, uh, some of you know him, uh, and a bunch of other colleagues. These people have contributed immensely. Now, I talked about the center that we're developing. Last month, the Mining for Miracles just gave us $3.4 million, so we're really fortunate. We are building this infrastructure for this equipment, and we're really trying to make this a unique facility in Canada. I'm looking for people who are interested in working in our lab. These people are telling me something, I think, to leave, <laughs> leave the room or uh, just FOAD. I'm not sure. Um, is that what you're saying? I, yeah, I, I think I know. If anyone's interested in uh, doing a postdoc or a PhD, please let me know. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have a question right here from this guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask about this, like, the 
the rhythms that you saw with uh, the uh, current, like the sudden uh, hit and death, they look pretty similar to what you see in the CPPT when they're stress induced. So could that be the reason that those uh, those infants were dying so prematurely? So I mean, it's a good question, and that's where we're going with the more enhanced and sophisticated. Phenotyping, CPVT, if you don't know, is catecholaminergic ventricular polymorphic tachycardia. Easy for you to say. I struggle with it. Uh, and it, most of the cases are due to mutations in the randine receptor. And most of those are a gain in function of the randine receptor. And most of the gain of function is due to the ability to sense or not sense calcium inside the lumen of the SR and the calcium escapes inappropriately between beats and it creates these alternate beats. So the etiology of CPV is different from what we're seeing here. This is probably calcium coming off the thin filament at a different rate, a slower rate, because the off rate constant is slower, may be seen by the, the sodium calcium exchanger, which is causal in the DADs we see in CPVT, but it's a different mechanism that precedes it. We don't know all the details yet, so that's why we're developing new reporter lines that are giving us information about what's happening at different parts of the cell when these arrhythmic events occur, like Montreal calcium inside the SR, et cetera, et cetera. We have a whole bunch of reporter lines that we either have or we're building right now. That'll give us a better answer to your question. Uh, it's a great question, and it's a huge uh, enigma to the field, and there's lots of papers on it. A lot of people thought it was from the reprogramming, so when you introduce the Yamanaka factors, but it turns out you see these in embryonic stem cells in which you don't have to reprogram, but it appears to be the prolonged tissue culture conditions, so these go through multiple passages, maybe 30 passages, so in each passage, the DNA is being replicated, you're putting them into new uh, wells, and you keep repeating this, so in that process of uh, regenerating the DNA, some copy errors are made, and the media is not allowing for the appropriate repair mechanisms. This is sort of what people are thinking right now, but the incidence is so high, as I mentioned, it cannot be ignored. So if you take these cells which have chromosomal aberrations and you differentiate them, it means they may not differentiate well or they may be exhibiting a phenotype that's related to the chromosomal aberration rather than the point mutation you've introduced. So you have to just reject those lines, but you have to know that they're bad to begin with. But in answer to your question, we don't know the exact answer, but it's probably the prolonged tissue culture. Most of these cells have gone through at least 30 passages. John. So just following up on that then, uh, when you're differentiating your cells into cardiomyocytes, yeah. do you also have to worry that they, through that process, may be going through some change in the genome? So we're developing an assay to screen for that, but it's less likely to happen because they do not proliferate. So they're not going through passaging. There's no passaging once they're differentiated. So it's a uh, terminally differentiated line now rather than a prolific line. And you know, we don't get cancer of the heart, but we get cancer of epithelial cells, et cetera, that are you know, being regenerated on a daily basis. That's where we get our cancers. Same idea. So it's still possible, but it's less likely. But we're doing an assay that we're actually monitoring it at that stage as well. 